Villainous Heroics by I Believe in a Happily Ever After on AO3. Chapter 9 The soft beams of spring sunlight fell into his room in leafed patterns. A warm breeze blowing pale blue curtains back from the open window. Golden sunlight and bright yellow gift on the sand next to his bed were the only bright colors in the room. Everything else in muted and demitted shades that made him unable to completely relax. Chota never had liked hospitals, and his inability to move, even the smallest amount, had him wanting to get up more and more as the moments trickled by. The only reason he hadn't tried yet was because there was half-hourly checks from doctors and nurses who had come to know him too well. A soft knock on the door let him know that it was time for another checkup. Shoto fought to not roll his eyes, instead keeping his gaze straight ahead. If it was another nurse or doctor, he might throw something, or at least attempt to. He had enough talks and warnings about what had happened to him during the USJ attack. Instead of a doctor, though, he heard a familiar voice calling out a soft, Hey, how are you feeling? Familiar heels had him glancing over to see that Namuri was dressed outside of her hero costume, a soft sweater dress and red shawl paired with the simple glasses. Fine, Shota replied after a moment because, well, he was fine. He wasn't at his best, but it could have been worse. He could have died instead of simply being rendered unconscious. If you say so, Namuri snorted not sounding very believing. It was reassuring more than anything else that she wasn't acting like he was on his deathbed like all his other visitors had been so far. Actually, now that Demuri was here, he might finally get an answer as to who had left the brightly colored gift he had been seeing for the last few days. Who left these? The bright yellow made him suspect All Might, due to the man no doubt blaming himself for what had happened at the USJ. But it didn't quite seem like his style. The flowers were disgustingly yellow, after all. Don't tell me you, of all people, can't tell. Namuri laughed, quiet and bright, as she plucked the card off the stand and opened it up. The inside had a doodle of a screaming cat with hearts around it. The other side reflecting a message to get well soon. Idiot. Shota murmured, turning away to attempt to hide the fact that his face was no doubt looking as flushed as it felt. Even after he had said the worst he could and avoided his usual route to try to get present Mike to stop endangering himself, the man had still sent him flowers and a get well card. Fuck, he was absolutely smitten. And there's more, Namuri half sang, tone teasing as she shut the card and flipped it over the back. He managed to cram a lot of writing onto this thing, you know? He also has horrible handwriting. Get to the point. There was more. It was probably something squeakingly sick. Or worse. Maybe having Namuri read it wasn't a good idea. Or set it down already. Too late, Namuri chirped. He wants you to know that he'll be taking over your patrol route until you get better. President Mike, what? It seems he found out about the whole things on the news. Oh, poor thing, he must have been distraught. Poor thing. Since when did you get so fond of him? Chota finally looked back to Namuri, frowning a bit at the almost serious look on her face. Namuri? Well... Remember when you gave me your patrol and I told you nothing had happened? I might have lied just a teensy bit. Namori gave a fake smile and Shota felt his heart plummet in his stomach. Namori, what did you do? He gave his patrols over to Midnight because his presence only seemed to encourage Mike. He was trying to steer him away from doing any villainy. But maybe Midnight had been the wrong choice in Hero. I just put him to sleep when he was causing trouble. I didn't even take him to the police station or anything. Nimari defended, looking as if she 
was accused of some great crime. You said he had a voice quirk, but I didn't take that to mean that he could level an entire city block. He did what? It wasn't that Shota hadn't realized how powerful Mike's quirk was, but he had never really used it. There was no way he had the power to level a block, though. That was my reaction. I looked around the whole area and at least five buildings were completely destroyed down to the ground and windows in mile radius were shattered. He was just waiting on a roof nearby the epicenter for, well, for you. Since it was only Namuri in the room, Toto allowed himself to slump even further against the bed, groaning quietly. Of course, Mike had done something like that just to get his attention. He was trying to prove a point. He had been trying to prove he could be a villain. Did he say anything before you knock him out? He certainly did put up a fight. Namuri huffed, crossing her arms and being careful not to bend the card. Jota was more thankful about that than he wanted to be. He probably could have fought me off if he hadn't realized what my quirk was too late. Told you. Mike was clever, and he could keep up with Shota's night after night. He had probably been taken by surprise when he hadn't expected midnight to show up. So, you took him by surprise? Of course, he was a bit of a dolt, Namori said, a laugh to her words before she met Shota's gaze. He said to tell you that it wasn't a game. This time... Chota's stomach felt like it was missing as much as All Might's was. Chota? I think I made a mistake, Namuri. It had seemed logical. It was the most logical idea to force Mike to become aware of the truth and then remove himself from the situation entirely. It had been perfect. Present Mike would have died a quiet death and whoever he truly was would be free to find some avenue of life that didn't end with the pain and a mistake he could never come back from. This, though, Mike had made a stance and proved that he wasn't going to be pushed back into a role of civilian, who was forced to do nothing except watch. He had attempted to make the world watch and had insisted that it hadn't been a game. To him, it probably wasn't. President Mike wasn't an idiot. He had been trying to garner attention, and the easiest way to get attention these days was to be a hero or... Yet. I'm sure you didn't make a mistake you can't fix, Namori finally said, waving the card around. I mean, he sent you flowers and a get-well card. Here, listen to this. Namori flipped to the back of the card again, clearing her throat. <clears> throat> Someone has to watch out for the kids trapped in this place. See? He's taking care of it all so you could rest. Like I said, he's definitely a vigilante. Chota stared at Namuri in the card before blinking slowly, trying to calmly sort out his thoughts and feelings before he gave a slow nod. Namuri. The woman leaned to her right, looking ready to run for the door. You were right. Oh, of course. But just to be certain, what was I right about this time? Namari watched him and Shota couldn't bring himself to do much more than to look over the flowers. He was almost grateful for the bandages that covered his face and, no doubt, sickening expression that was forming. Oh. Oh! You really do have feelings for him! <laughs> Namuri's crackling laughter was almost more reassuring than it was annoying. Shota, sighing and watching the golden sunlight start to fade and make way for soft, cool blues. The bright yellow flowers and cards seemed to warm his room just fine, though. Shota stood by his decision to return to the school as quickly as possible, but unlike some people seemed to think, he wasn't unaware of the limitation of his body, especially after all that had happened to it. His healing session with Recovery Girl were slow and going. With his insomnia and sleep problems, only so much of his body could be healed at a time. The result was a constant state of exhaustion and pain that never seemed to leave. 
He had taken to sleeping on the couch most nights, too tired and sore to make it to his bedroom. The only bright side was that falling asleep on the couch often meant he could catch snippets of President Mike's radio show when he had the energy to stay conscious. The weekly show was still midnight to five on Friday nights, though the next morning on Sun Saturday, but Shota caught bits and pieces of the voice throughout the weekends, as if he couldn't stop himself from being on the radio as much as possible. He would have been a good radio host, Shota mused. There were so many stats and ratings and changing news on heroes and villains. Shota could easily see the need to use a radio station to sign for it all. Mike would have run it wonderfully, he was sure. The one good thing about being confined to his apartment was that he had plenty of time to catch up on grading homework and work on his case files. The largest was, without a doubt, the open case on Trigger. There was multiple heroes and police officers working on it, but Jota seemed to have taken on the brute of it. Working while listening to Mike's show, though what made him realize just who the anonymous source was the tuning in the many dealers and users associated with Trigger. Working while listening to Mike's show, though, was what made him... Working while listening to Mike's show was what made him realize just who the anonymous source was that turning in all the many dealers and users associated with Trigger. The man was turning out to be something else entirely. He also didn't seem to know when to stop pushing himself. Sorry for that last interruption, dear listeners. It's been a pretty busy week for me here. But I can promise that you're not getting rid of me quite yet. Though the police and heroes are welcome to try. The expecto crackled, full of wild energy, was instead a quiet, strained laugh that showed just how thin the man has been stretching himself. The USJ attack must have shaken him up as much as it did the rest of the world. Never before had children training to be heroes came so close to dying. All right, dear listeners, let's take some requests and get your jam session for the night underway. Absently tapping his pencil against the edge of his work, Shota stared at the radio as he listened to Mike's voice. He knew that he himself had a problem with wearing himself thin, but Mike sounded like he had passed that point long ago. Considering the new stories coming out about him, his involvement in the USJ, it was possible Mike thought Eraserhead was dying. I suppose there's nothing for it, Shota sighed, scratching at Jelly's head and smiling at her loud purrs. The chocolates weren't the worst thing, after all. It hadn't been until the case on his arms had come off that he'd been able to open the gift left by President Mike, but once he had, he had found a collection of dark chocolates that were filled with caffeine. They had been surprisingly good, and Shota surprised that deserved a small thank you, or at least the acknowledgement that Shota was fine and Eraserhead would soon be back to work and kicking Mike's ass during his villainous attempts. Dialing up the number he had regrettably memorized, Shota waited until he heard the dial sound of Mike greeting him on both the radio and through the phone. Yo, dear listener, you're on with present Mike. What's your song request for the evening? Right. Song request. Hmm. Play that song you sang when you kidnapped me. There was absolute silence from both phone and radio. Shota frowned as he pulled his phone back enough to check if the call was still going. A a racer head! There was a loud sound of objects breaking and clashing around the ground that was soon followed by Mike swearing loudly at the fact that it seemed his quirk had slipped. It was... Cute. Shit. And Murray listened to Mike's shows, too. And she could recognize his voice. Never mind the fact that Mike had just screamed his name over the show. You're alive! Holy shit! You're actually alive! And, okay, and not dead! If you were a sanctuated broadcast, you would have been shut down by now. Chota drawled. Pleased he didn't have to hide his smile at the fact that Mike was swearing and cussing over live air. You're also an idiot if you think I'm going to die from a few thugs with inflammated egos. You're actually okay. 
The breath of Mike release sounded like it had carried weeks of tension. Toto found himself feeling bad for the stress he had caused the man, even if it was unintentional. Wait, did you actually call in a request a song? What other reason would I have to call in? Chota hung up before he could say something incriminating, hitting himself with a smile he could feel on his face at Mike's <laughs> laughter, wild and loud and bright and filling up each inch of his apartment. Well, listeners, <laughs> next up is a song request that I'm dedicating to my favorite listener. I expect you to be back out on the street soon, hero. The song that was imprinted across his memory started up and Shota relaxed back into the couch, gently scratching Jelly's back as he sighed and closed his eyes for a moment. He was in far too deep with present Mike. It was almost a shame that he couldn't even bring himself to regret one moment of it. Oh, come on, Eraserhead. You're so grumpy tonight. I think we need to erase that bad attitude. <laughs> Fukukado Emi, better known as the hero, Miss Joke, burst into laughter that made Shota want to lose his hearing altogether. He could only be grateful that he didn't need to waste his energy using his quirk to stop her own. Even she knew better to use her quirk on him when they were out on active patrol. You're noisy, Shota murmured, trailing along behind her as they walked the streets. He would usually take the rooftops, but Joke had never quite been able to keep up with him that way. The knights, they and their agencies, partnered together, usually meant his feet, stayed on the ground. Come on, Eraser, just go on a date with me. Weeks of recovery, days of arguing that he was ready, and long, tenderous hours of reassuring Nemi, and Shota had finally been allowed back on patrol. He was then chained to joke because he assumed everyone hated him. I know you're not busy this weekend. Drop it, joke. He wasn't busy because Nomure had practically forced him to take more breaks until his body fully recovered. He was feeling exhausted now, but he had a feeling that had more to do with joke than anything else. Oh, I see how it is, the racer head. Head? snapping up at the familiar voice. Tota startled as he saw President Mike standing a few feet away from them. The man looked wrong. His entire stance was closed off and his face was blank of emotion. What the hell had happened? He had been fine on his last radio show. Just tell me, what does she have that I don't? President Mike, it seemed, was an ugly crier. He was also an absolute idiot, because he was now sobbing over what Shoto assumed was the fact that he and Joke, of all people, were in a relationship. He honestly felt like he was losing brain cells the longer he tried to wrap his head around that thought. Finally, though, he managed to say the few words he had spoken to Mike since the last time they'd seen each other. Well, brains, for a start. Wait, 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 wait. This is present Mike. Joke was beaming, looking between the two before Shota saw an evil glitter in her eyes that reminded him far too much of Namure. You're the one Eraser's always talking about, right? The funny, cute one with the radio show? Namure, that rat. I'm what? Mike's crying stopped at once. The man blinging at them with wide, startled eyes. Toto wished, with everything in him, that his quirk allowed him to sink into the earth and disappear. Yeah, yeah, even I've heard a lot about you. Man, eraser, no wonder you keep rejecting my date offers when you have your eye on this guy. I do not. You talk about me. The smile, so bright. Shota had always thought it was ridiculous to describe people in comparison to objects or nature, but, well, looking at Mike's smile was like looking at the sunlight. I mentioned you, Shota finally concerned, watching with detached horror as Mike and Joke proceeded to laugh, 
bold and became the best of friends within ten minutes. It seemed that Joke had not only betrayed his trust, but that Shota would never had be able to live this night down. Well then, hero, how goes the day? It had taken a better part of the night, but Shota had finally managed to separate Mike and Joke from becoming blood siblings. He was still trying to figure out when exactly that had ended with him and Mike sitting on a roof, legs swinging over the side. Didn't it be night? Shota raised an eyebrow, keeping a blank face at Mike's quiet, soft laugh. It was harder than he thought to not smile. I'm fine. Nobody's yet to believe me when I say that, though. A good reason, I think. You look like a mummy the last time I saw you on the news. It... It didn't look good, Racer. The media has been having a field day about the attack at UA Training Field. I'm aware. The media hadn't separated any forces when it come to ripping into the hero for their inability to stop the attack before it happened. The world always had its eye on the hero school, and Japan had a spotlight on UA. To see the children attack and even All Might almost losing, it was a sobering reality. We'll recover. You, Eraser, are too much of what a hero should be. At the sharp, bitter laughter, she had to glance over. Mike had removed his speakers and had his headphones resting against his neck. Hearing aids, clear to see, with the way his hair was styled. Shota was trying to figure out how the man could handle ear piercings when wearing hearing aids and headphones. I'm not sure that's a good thing. There are some that would agree with you, Shota finally said, looking back down to the streets below them. What's the point of having the power to help? even though we don't. You're something else, hero. Stretching at the name a bit, Shota looked back at Mike and felt guilt crawling at him as it had been since he heard about Mike's encounter with Nomure. Oh, that's not a good look. You know you could give a guy the wrong... I'm sorry. Hmm. It looked like he had finally found his way to shut Mike up. Of course, it came at the expense of his pride, but... Well, this was more important than pride. I don't regret the intent behind my words, but I do regret how I phrased them. I'm also sorry that it took so long to give you the apology you deserved. Ah, jeez, I... No, you don't have to. Mike fumbled with his words for a moment, finally groaning as he rubbed at his eyes. It's not like anything you were saying was... Wrong. Can you repeat that? I want to make sure you realize you just said you were wrong, and I was right. There was a punch at his shoulders that had him give a quiet huff of laughter. Mike perked up at the sound. Still, what I said was cruel. If it hadn't been you, then it would have been someone else, eventually. I'm willing to pretend it never happened if you are, though. Hmm, that seemed... Reasonable. That's a yes? Sure. The two were quiet for a moment, something Shota still couldn't believe President Mike was capable of. Finally, though, he broke the silence with a question that had been on his mind since they saw each other earlier. Are you going to tell me what's still bothering you? You haven't even made an attempt to cause trouble tonight. Ah, you're too smart for me, Eraserhead. Mike sighed. Loud and dramatic, he was hiding, but Shota didn't know what. Yet. That attack, the USJ attack, they're calling it? Unoriginal, but accurate. Shota snorted, giving a nod. What about it? I already told you I was fine. The kids are too. No, it's not. Someone approached me right before the attack. He said he wanted me to join a party he and his friends were throwing. He then implied that there was a way to bring down All Might. I don't know if they were working with that trigger dealer, but they know the same circles. How could you tell? This was serious then. If there was an overlap between these groups, then what was the common thread? It had to be more than just a spike in villainy activity. A league of their own. A familiar face, right? 
It was a phrase the dealer had said over Mike's show. The dealer and this guy both phrased it exactly like that. There's an organization to it all, then. That meant more work, and it also meant more danger. Gangs and groups were one thing, but organized villainy, to the extent of what happened at USJ, Shota couldn't help but feel those villains he had seen in the center of it all had something to do with it. The man covered in hands and the monster that had almost defeated All Might. I should have accepted that offer. That had him startled. Mike's voice flat and serious. I should have accepted so I could have been there. I could have... Shit! I could have done something. There's a chance you wouldn't have been hurt so bad if I was there. And there is a chance that nothing would have changed, Shitta said, cutting him off before he could spiral into whatever dark thoughts were picking away at him. Your appearance could have made a difference, but then you would be in a jail cell for longer than a week. Besides, I'm fine. The moment was slow and cautious, but Shota still found himself unable to react as Mike's hand settled on his cheek, a rough and calculated thumb brushing against the scar that was now under his eye. You, my hero, are in no way fine, Mike said softly, voice quiet and wrecked. You could have died. I... He had done his best not to think about it. Shota had been doing his absolute best not to think about it, but he really could have. It was nothing short of a miracle in his own stubbornness that he was still here. And leave you to run rampage? I'd be a poor hero in that case. Hmm, I suppose we can't have that. The thumb pressed against the scar for a moment, Mike's skin dragging along his own and causing a new, unfamiliar feeling that had Shota shuddering with a hitch of his breath. You'll be the end of me, hero. Mike's voice was soft and warm as his touch. Bright green eyes stared at him with something that Shota was too afraid to even begin to name. As he stared at the man who had called himself a villain, and yet proved himself the opposite, Shota couldn't help but realize the truth. Maybe he would be the end of Mike, but he knew, without a doubt, that this man would be the end of him. Y'all should have kissed! That should have been a kiss! <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is slow burn. I think that's one of the tags. Hold up, let me check. I like how I just went straight into the, what's it called? Outro. I didn't even stop to, you know, uh... Yeah, it says slow burn. Well, I mean, we're already in, in chapter 9. That's halfway, right? So we're entering the territory of, ooh, they could start to get together. Um, that was very emotional. Hee <laughs> hee. Um, emotional in the sense of I really genuinely thought that uh, um, President Mike was going to talk about uh, the, the thingy before uh, the attack actually happened. Uh, apparently I was wrong, but... That is very interesting, indeed. Very, very interesting. Um, this one, this video, I know it's a little late. Okay, it's, it's a whole lot late. It's like way past 10 p.m. when I'm recording this. Um, I've been late Christmas shopping. And by me, I mean my stepdad for my mom because he always does this. He always does this. Three days, two days, five days ahead of time. Maybe if we're lucky, a week ahead of time. He buys the stuff that he's going to buy for her, right? And I noticed my whole family does this. Right? And I'm like, what the frick? I'm over here. I have all their presents months in advance. Like, for example, my brother's present, I had since last year. December of last year. That's how, like, advanced I think of these presents because I put a lot of thought into my presents, you know? A lot, a lot of thought. I feel like some characters in My Hero Academia would also do that. I don't know, I feel like President Mike would be one of those that puts a lot of thought. Like, maybe not as advanced as me, like, you know, the whole one year kind of thing. But maybe uh, two, three months in ahead, you know? But back to what I was saying and the reason why this is so late and stuff like that. But uh, that was interesting set of events, right? It was very angsty, indeed. I will say that. But I feel like we're getting somewhere. That roof scene, though, that was very gay. I'm sorry, but Eraserhead, you're letting him have your his hand on your cheek and rubbing his thumb? 
caressing your cheek? I'm sorry. I was wholeheartedly expecting a kiss. I hope I'm not the only one who was expecting like a little smoochy smooch, a little kissy kiss. There was multiple times where I had to stop the recording because, ah, ah, they should kiss. But then it ended and they didn't kiss. And yeah, but like, I'm sorry, but the little, little smoochy smooch? Oh my god, I just realized. I went to go search in the fanfic if the tag was slow burn and I just realized that one of the tags I added um, for the thumbnail that it chose from like the, the other tags was slow burn. It's right there. I'm reading it right now. I'm <laughs> I just looked up and seen that. Ugh, I hate myself. But yeah, it's very interesting. And I wonder if, you know, present Mike, obviously Hisashi, is going to blame himself in a bit for not um, being there and helping Eraser. And I wonder if Shota's, like, I know Shota's probably grateful that he wasn't because, yeah, Eraser has a point. He would be facing way more bigger charges and he would be there way more. Like, he would be in the jail cell for longer, right? He would, he would actually be a villain in that sense. And not in the sense, like, obviously Eraser wants, quote-unquote, not Eraser, uh, President Mike, quote-unquote, wants to be a villain, but let's be honest, he doesn't. He's a vigilante and... Literally, I don't even think he qualifies as an anti-hero. He hasn't done something that is necessarily anti-hero. He's just been a vigilante, right? He hasn't killed anybody. He hasn't, like... Anti-hero is, 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 is too far deep in the vigilante area. Like, I, I... It's hard to, you know, really, like, picture it. But, like, I feel like he's more of a vigilante than an anti-hero, to be honest. He falls more into vigilanteism, you know? Um, also, uh, can they just smooch? Can that be a thing? We already established that they both like each other. Shota's head over heels. Eraser heads head over heels. Hold up. That's the same person. <laughs> um, present Mike is head over heels. You know, they're both head over heels. Just have them fall in love. Just do a little kissy kiss, you know, and have the rest of the fanfic be about how they can damage their lives of being together. Which reminds me, there's actually a fanfic like that, but except Hisashi is actually a vigilante and not a villain. And the first series is about them getting together, and then the second series is them actually being together. I really enjoyed that series. I should see if I could pop pick it. I think I've already asked, but I'll make sure if I've asked already because that was a really good fic. Um, oh shit, now I will remember why I haven't podge picked that one. It has smut, but it was a really good one. Do I eat my pride and pod pick a smut? Do I eat my pride and pod fic a smut? Ooh. God, but it was a really good fanfic. It just had some smutty parts. It's not even just a lot. It was just like one chapter of smut. Literally, that's it. It's only one chapter of smut. I could get by one chapter of smut. Why am I actually debating this? I'll debate this. I'll sleep on it. <laughs> I'll sleep on it. Otherwise, I'll ask. Because if I do open up the smut, that opens up a lot of Eraser Mike fanfiction for me. To podfic. Because let's just say I read a lot of them where it has like, it's like eventual smut as one of the tags. Look, I don't like my smut with plot. I like my plot with smut. There is a huge difference. Those who know the difference, kudos to you. Those who don't, um, I don't know what to tell you. It's just different. Um... But yeah, I'm I'm genuinely debating it. If so, this opens up a lot of fan fiction with Eraser Mike because let's just say if I open up my archive of all the fanfics I've read and I go to Eraser Mike alone, some of these like Hook Line and Sinker by Kira Kiri on AO3, that was a really good one. It just it has a smutty episode or a chapter, which is why I haven't done it. At odd ends, that's actually one that I'm actually considering because it does have smut quite a lot of it, but it has abbreviated versions of the smut for those who don't necessarily like reading, you know, spicy stuff. Um, and then obviously we have, oh, in the wrong dimension. What is that one? Oh, I remember that one. Okay, yeah, no, I'm not pop picking that one. Uh, that was a, that was, that was something. <laughs> that was something. But, you know, at odd ends and hook, line, and sinker would be two that are open up for me. And any other, oh, wait, hold up. And the, obviously the vigilante AU, which would be Telltale and The Path We Chose, which are both really lengthy fan fictions. I will say that. Really, really lengthy ones, like, oof. But it would open up a lot of fan fiction for me to um, podfic. Uh, Eraser Mike, of course, 
it's the only pair I read smut of. Oh, there's Hot Wings. Yeah, Hot Wings, another one. I don't read Hot Wings that much, though, so. I do ship them a lot. I love that ship, but I, surprisingly, I haven't read any fan fiction of that ship. I should read fan fiction of that ship. I'm probably gonna read fan fiction of that ship later today, but, or tonight, it's literally almost midnight. It's an hour before midnight. I need to be sleeping. I need to wake up early tomorrow to record more videos and contemplate if I want to do smut. I can't believe I'm contemplating if I want to do smut. Okay, as always, my raindrops. Make sure to eat, sleep, drink water, take your meds. Have a wonderful day or night. Links to my social and Discord server are down in the description. Subscribe to see more of my content, and thank you so much for watching.